knew several days in advance that this uh, had a potential to be a very significant travel uh, impact day. And, you know, there was a lot of school closings. And people were prepared uh, to a degree, but I think noting that it's hard for people to take threats seriously until they personally experience it. So it, it's if you haven't been in, say, a tornado before, your reaction to that is quite different than someone that's actually been in a tornado where, where their home has been significantly damaged or wherever they were. It just impacts you differently. And a lot of studies have you know, correlated that in, in, the, in social science. So uh, that's something that we have to keep in mind. So going into this event, um, this is one of our models. This is called the European model. And what this is, it, it's an ensemble. So uh, each model has a, if you tweak the initial conditions, um, you can get a significantly different result depending on the circumstance. So if you throw a bunch of what we say European ensemble members, so it's the same, same model per se, but it has a little tweaks to it. And it gives you a better idea of, of reaching a consensus what the most likely scenario is. And you can see um, as you get into Friday morning and past, say, um, the daybreak hour, you're seeing that red. Um, that's an indication of that freezing rain and sleet. So you can see the rain is transitioning over to that icy mixture. And, and the, exact, the exact timing is, is certainly not going to be known by looking at something by this, but it's going to give you a very good idea of what may unfold. Uh, during the day. So really helpful when you put a forecast together. And again, that was really the big challenge. There wasn't a question. We knew this was going to rain to ice, uh, but we didn't know the exact timing. And that's a big difference if it occurs at, say, 6 a.m. versus 9 a.m. Obviously, you're impacting a much larger portion of the morning commute. Uh, and then the other question is, were you going to get more sleet versus freezing rain? Freezing rain, obviously, is you know, very significant in terms of if you get a significant amount of it, you're going to have widespread power outages. While sleet is bad, it's mainly just going to cause traffic issues. So uh, that's something utility companies are really going to focus on. If it's sleet, you know, the worry is at the DOT. But if it's freezing rain, then you know, utility companies are going to have to worry about it. So um, this was a highly anomalous event. When we say that, we basically, it's a fancy way of saying um, a, a kind of an unusual event. And the models did um, a fairly good job. They may have been a little quick in changing things over south of the Massachusetts Turnpike, but again, they had the right idea. So uh, this is again, um, similar to what we looked at a couple slides ago. This is from a, the GFS model and basically it's, it's the same model in tweaking the initial conditions slightly and gives you an idea of what may happen. Uh, but what you'll see here is the black line is, is the mean precipitation amount that the model's expecting. So it's it's telling you that their mean is over an inch and a half of, of whether that be rain melted down or you know the mixture of sleet, freezing rain, whatever that may be. But you can see all the members are, are pretty robust in the amount of uh, precipitation. Um, the vast majority of them are over an inch of precipitation. So that's telling you it's going to be a significant precipitation event. So keep in mind, if we're talking about an inch of precipitation, if it was all snow, we're generally talking at least 10 inches, if not more, of snow. Um, and another thing we look at are um, putting the ingredients together. All these little symbols there where you see Q, PW, IVT, they're all different parameters we look at that have to deal with moisture. And when you see max, 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 that's a signal to the forecaster that this is maxed out in the model's climatology. And what that basically means is it's outside the model's climatology range. So it's telling you it's a very unusual setup. And when you have an unusual setup, that's when you can expect a significant event, a rare event. It doesn't always happen, but it's a signal to keep in mind when you're putting together a forecast. And again, this is looking at these individual parameters um, side by side. So what you'll see on the left, upper left, that's P watt precipital water. It gives you an idea just how much moisture uh, you're able to work with. And then um, the probabilities of exceeding one inch uh, two inches of, of precipitation. So that's pretty high. I mean, that's an, an ensemble member, a bunch of them 
thrown together. So usually when you do that, if it's a significant event, sometimes it's on the lower end of it because you're kind of weighing it out. But so when you see uh, pretty good probabilities of over two inches, you're really talking about a significant uh, event there in terms of just precipitation alone. So again, this is kind of a, another way of looking at it uh, for Worcester, um, looking at the um, you know, mediogram and basically indicating you know, rain um, changing to ice. And notice what you don't see a lot of, the purple, that's snow. Look how little of that. It's mainly rain changing to a little bit of freezing rain and a lot of sleet, but you don't really see um, the snow highlighted in that. Models did really good with that. This was not really a snow event. And you'll get the same idea. This is Windsor Locks. So what you'll notice is as you get into Connecticut, you know, you're further south, obviously, than Worcester, you're seeing more rain. The rain's lasting longer. Uh, and that's what we were trying to kind of communicate, that the biggest issues for the morning rush hour would be north of the Massachusetts Turnpike. And then the evening rush hour would be, would be impacted in, across the entire region. So that allows places like on the south coast, some of those, I, I was aware that some of the schools decided to have a half day because they knew that everything would be okay in the morning, it'd be coming icy in the afternoon, where, where areas in northern Massachusetts, they tended to cancel things more regularly because they knew that both commutes would be impacted. So that's the type of information a lot of our customers are looking for. And again, this is Providence here. You'll even see more rain there. And you see that later, the changeover occurring later there. So again, that's a really good indication of the timing. It, you know, the models aren't gonna be exact, but you know, they're getting a lot better than they were a few decades ago, even 10 years ago. So we can really nail down the timing a lot better than we ever could before. And hi, Annis, this is um, again, another, um, scenario where it's basically most of Friday's rain. So basically it's telling you if you're on the Cape, you know, basically you're you're not really dealing with any frozen precipitation until, you know, maybe late in the evening commute where you're, you're dealing with some, a little bit of snow um, and a little bit of, of freezing rain or sleet. But again, it, the timing um, often is more important than even the exact amounts in, in terms of impacts. So this is a kind of a look at the total precipitation forecast from the HREP, that's an ensemble model that we really like to look at inside 48 hours. And then you have the NAM and then the GFS. And it's like anything else, when, you, when you're looking at a bunch of data and it all agrees, then your confidence in the event is fairly high. If we had a scenario where the HREP was high and the NAM was low, then we're not as uncertain we're more uncertain and we're going to have to kind of convey the uncertainty. But in this case, we knew it was going to be a very significant precipitation event. And again, this is a simulation here. We're looking at the GFS and the three kilometer NAM. So the GFS is on the left and the NAM is on the right. And you'll see the General gist of everything is the same, but you'll see the timing differences exist. Um, you'll see the colder air coming in, you know, a, a bit quicker on, you know, the left there. Um, and then you'll see more in the way of, say, snow, but in the NAM on the right, it tends to have better resolution. So you kind of see a lot more of, of that um, uh, red and uh, purple there. So again, it, it it's, not to be taken exactly literally, like that's how it's going to unfold, but that's our job as forecasters to look at the, each model, kind of pick which one may be better in a particular scenario. And this is a, a later run of the three kilometer NAM, and this is tends to be how things go. Um, the model could speed up a couple hours. It could slow down a few hours. Uh, in this case, it did slow down a couple hours, uh, but the main idea of the forecast was was still intact. And a lot of times, you know, for a, a forecast that's 24 hours out, you know, we're really able these days to kind of nail things down within, you know, one to three hours, which is a lot better than we ever were able to do so before. And a look at the temperatures. Uh, one thing you'll notice is um, 
if you look up into Canada, you'll see like wh where it says 1036, that's, an, that's a pressure level of a surface high. When you start to see a high pressure system over 1030 millibars, that's indication of a strong high. And that allows a lot of low level cold air sometimes to bleed down. And that's exactly what happened. And another thing that may be difficult to see from this image, but those little wind barbs, they're pointing from the north and northeast. Normally, when we get cold air behind a system, the wind shifts to more of the northwest and it dries you out before you change over to ice and snow. But in this case, the wind is more from the north and northeast. So that doesn't dry you out as much and you're able to sustain precipitation longer. And that allows that, that transition to more ice and snow than you would often see. And again, this is a uh, HREF simulation, very uh, similar uh, to what we saw with a three kilometer NAM. Again, that purple is the mix. Um, and then the red shading is, is freezing rain. Uh, one thing we've noticed, sometimes the HREF can be a little, little too aggressive with the amount of freezing rain. Uh, so, you know, we factor that into the, the forecast, but you'll notice one thing, there's very little snow in our area with this. So it's, it's mainly rain going to ice and because the cold air came in shallow. And we're going to look at that in a bit here. So again, this is um, the um, freezing rain accumulation tool from the HREF. And like we said, it had a lot of ice and there was some ice with this. You know, there was a 10 to a quarter inch in a lot of places, uh, but it was a bit overdone. And again, that's something we see with the HREF at times, it tends to produce more freezing rain than what actually occurs. So let's take a quick review of how we get the precipitation type we get. So this is a look at the atmosphere. You're looking, remember, we're looking as we go up in the atmosphere, trying to visualize it not on a surface, but like three dimensional. If basically, if your environmental temperature is below freezing, you're gonna get snow. If the whole atmosphere is below freezing, it's gonna snow. Now, let's say you have a shallow warm layer. So it's cold in the cloud, the precipitation starts as snow, then you hit that warm layer where it's above zero Celsius, let's say uh, it could be eight, nine, 10,000 feet, wherever, um, it's going to melt or at least partially melt into say raindrops. As, you, as those raindrops continue to sink down, there's a deep cold layer that allows the, the, the drops to refreeze into something called sleet. And that's those little ice balls that, you know, bounce off your car, um, usually really small, but this is a portrait of the atmosphere that we had in place um, on that day in early February. Now, we were fortunate that we didn't have a situation like this. This is where you have a deeper warm layer and that allows the snow, as it comes from the cloud where it's really cold, it melts into rain, but the, sh the cold layer is so shallow that it doesn't get a chance to refreeze into those little ice balls, but instead it freezes on the ground and it freezes on power lines. That's why you can get significant power outages in these type of events. We had a you know really bad ice storm in the Worcester Hills, that area in uh, December of 2008. So, Again, that's the worst kind of precipitation. And we were fortunate in this case that for the most part, the cold air was deep enough to result in mainly uh, sleet. And to look at the soundings, again, this is just another way of looking at um, what we've been talking about. So this is um, the sounding for Boston, right around 15Z. And um, you see that zero line, uh, temperatures are just starting to get in that range there but you'll see there's that big warm layer above that you know not area above say 900 millibars to all the way up to 750 millibars is above freezing so that's going to be rain and then there's not going to be an ample time for that to freeze into sleep but as we move along notice what happens that cold layer gets a lot deeper so basically you're you're now below um that well below that zero Celsius line, um, say below 3,500 feet. So even though you have that big warm layer from say 4,000 feet 
to the you know nine ten thousand feet there's enough time for those raindrops to freeze into those little sleep balls and again this is just another image um, further in the day we still have that warm layer that's preventing much snow um, and look at the winds that two one two seven that means that's the degree you just put a zero in front of it so it's north northeast oh 20 oh 30 degrees that's allowing that cold air to come right from northern new england right into our area a lot of times when we get northwest winds first we get down slope say you know off the terrain not that we have the mountains like we do out west but it still acts as a, a warming mechanism but when it comes down from like almost the due north that's a direct feed of of cold air right from canada and this is a look at the um Boston uh, precipitation from the three kilometer NAM. Again, this is just a, a give you a ballpark estimate. This is available on, on our Buffett soundings, but notice how it has raining into Friday morning, then a very brief period that you see that red, that's, that's indication of the freezing rain because you have a very shallow cool layer at the surface now. It's not large enough to refreeze into sleet, but then that layer deepens and then you see all those oranges there. That's the sleet. And then one little snowflake at the end there. That's basically telling you this is mainly sleet. So um, quite the event. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Joe, who's going to talk about the messaging and how we went about conveying um, this event. All right. Thanks, Hayden. Great introduction to this. Uh, this was definitely a forecast and messaging challenge, too. So uh, in the days leading up, um, I believe this was a couple of days before early in the morning, um, we actually inter issued a winter storm watch. Um, it wasn't so much for the snowfall amounts. You can see here in the in the graphic on the left, we only had forecast totals of two to six inches, which is actually below our um, criteria for a winter storm warning. But um, we were concerned more about the travel impacts. So the roads becoming uh, slippery during the Friday morning commute with a possible flash freeze, as Hayden showed with that those north northeast winds. Um, bringing the colder air down quickly. Uh, so confidence was highest across most of interior Massachusetts and then actually into Boston as well. Um, I remember actually having worked this event. Um, we weren't quite as confident for, say, Hartford, Providence, and southeast Massachusetts due to the timing was going to be a little bit later. So the watch was issued for much of, uh, you know, the Mass Pike area north and, and our neighboring offices, I believe, also issued watches uh, across New Hampshire and across eastern New York. But you can see the snowfall totals definitely aren't anything, you know, to be excited about if you're a snow leveler. But um, certainly the, the impact alone um, kind of justified us issuing the winter storm watch. And then eventually that um, translated over to winter storm warnings here in the pink. This would have been uh, the day before early in the morning. So this is Thursday early morning forecast. Winter storm warnings you can see in New Hampshire, Vermont, and into um, northern, north central and northwest Massachusetts with winter weather advisories elsewhere. And that's because uh, the, the higher snow accumulations, and by that I mean you know three to six inches at most, were confined to these areas in the pink. And um, we were more confident in only about an inch or two of snow sleet combination um, further south. But again, it was the travel impacts, the flash freeze um, that, you know, really wanted us to kind of bump up the messaging for this event and have uh, advisories and warnings in place. And you can see on the right, not much icing, less than a quarter of an inch and, and just an inch or two of, of snow with a little bit more further to the north. So thrown in all between, if you remember this, we also had warmer air coming in. And in the midst of this event, we actually had some dense fog for a couple of nights. Uh, the first uh, formed more dense was Thursday morning. Uh, we had southwest winds moving over. Remember, the deep snowpack was still kind of left over from the blizzard uh, the weekend before. So we had a lot of dense fog across the area, especially near the, the south coast, the Cape and the islands. So, uh, you know, in the midst of all that, we also had some travel issues because of fog. And then again, uh, Thursday night into Friday morning was a little bit more widespread, as you can see on the graphic here. Um, Again, a lot of near zero visibilities across the region as that milder air was kind of bumping up into that deep snowpack that was still in place. But going back to the uh, the flash freeze, actually, as it was starting to occur, this this graphic on the left is from Friday morning at about uh, 740. Um, already seeing some impacts across the Merrimack Valley. 
uh, as the temperatures were starting to drop. And uh, they really, this is a nice graphic just highlighting, you know, the area uh, saying it's already happening up here and then um, gradually going to head south uh, during the morning and into the afternoon. So really tried to focus on the dangerous travel conditions because that was the main impact from this. And unfortunately, as Hayden showed in the start, there were a lot of travel impacts, hundreds of accidents, especially in Massachusetts. So let's take a look here at just an analysis of the event, uh, kind of what transpired uh, to, to kind of show, uh, you know, the models actually did a really good job from what Hayden uh, showed us in the beginning. So we had a strong, I'll show some maps with a strong southwest flow aloft. What that tends to do, it brings in a lot of Gulf uh, of Mexico moisture and also warm air. Again, that's aloft, so that's going to result in our mixed precipitation and something called uh, frontogenesis at the lower levels. Just think of that as lift from a temperature difference and I'll show what that looks like. Um, that gave us some added lift. But overall, and even going into the, this event, and the forecasters correctly recognize this, the larger scale pattern just wasn't favorable for heavy snow with all the warm air aloft. And uh, you'll see the lows aloft five, 10,000 feet tracking to our west. That's not good for a big snowstorm here. Um, and it really was those lower level temperatures you know, here at the surface at about 925 millibars or about 2,500 feet and 850 millibars, about 5,000 feet. Those are really critical uh, to help determine change over time and precip types. So like Hayden showed in those soundings, that's where we really have to hone in to determine uh, change over times. And then as Hayden also mentioned, the flash freezes typically occur here with a north or northeast winds. Those bring in sub-freezing air quickly from New Hampshire and points north, uh, tend to keep the low level moisture locked in too, whereas those west and northwest winds usually bring some drying and prevent rapid icing from occurring. Oop, let me go back. Here we go. So this is a satellite loop and uh, just shows really where that moisture plume came from. And you can see it has its origins here in the Gulf of Mexico all the way up and through the Appalachians, the Mid-Atlantic and into here in the Northeast. So definitely a very large moisture plume extending all the way from the Gulf of Mexico. And that's usually a good recipe for, for not just moisture, but also some warmer air aloft. So this is that, um, if you've been with us before and seen our maps, we talk about the different pressure levels. This is 500 millibars, which is essentially your steering flow. It's at about 18,000 feet. And you can see uh, following, the wind kind of parallels these contours. So you can see the little wind barbs too. It's all out of the southwest, so southwest to northeast. And that's what helped transport that moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. If we go down a little bit now, so this is at about 10,000 feet. Again, you still have that very deep and strong southwest flow and the green shading is showing areas of higher moisture. So uh, the moisture is not shallow. It actually is fairly deep in, in the higher levels of the atmosphere uh, and warm too. So that also gives us that chance for mixed precipitation. As Hayden showed the precipitable water, um, this is another way of looking at it on a map. You can see the axis here by the red dashed line, values of over about an inch, inch and a half. And what that means is if you were to look above you and just kind of wring out all of the moisture that's in the atmosphere, that's how much, essentially how much rainfall you would see. So you're looking at, you know, values well over an inch, which for early February are pretty unusual, pretty impressive. So not something we always see. Looking at some of the moisture transport, this is at about uh, 5,000 feet again. Uh, notice, first of all, the low, there's a closed low to our west, and that's not a good recipe for snow. Typically, the heavier snows fall to the northwest of these lows. So you've got strong southwest flow, and this pink and, and green are all showing areas of very strong moisture transport. And kind of the longer these arrows, the stronger the moisture transport is. So you can see our area in southern New England is right under the gun for the best moisture transport aloft. Now, this is what I was talking about, about frontogenesis. So this is down around 2,500 feet. And notice we've got a very strong temperature difference. So there's a lot of lines packed into a, a small area. So notice all the blue and especially red lines here in southern New England. That's, these are all different temperature contours. So you've got a very large change in temperature over a relatively small distance. So that tells us there's a big temperature contrast. And that tells us there's what's called low-level frontogenesis or lift. Think about it as about a kind of a front that's located up about 2,500 feet or so in the atmosphere. And that front, much like a cold front or a warm front, is going to generate a lot of lift and help generate precipitation. So this is just another way of looking at it. This is between that 2,500 and 5,000 foot level. The red contours show the axis of frontogenesis from 
down in DC, up through New York and into Providence and off into the Gulf of Maine. So typically the heaviest uh, precipitation falls just to the northwest of this feature, um, which is why we had some of the heavier snow amounts and heavier liquid precipitation amounts just a bit to the north. So to, to just wrap up our, our analysis here, notice this, I'm gonna go through some weather maps here starting at 6 a.m. and we've kind of marked where the freezing line is. Notice 6 a.m. on uh, Friday, it's, you know, 35 in Boston, it's in the 50s down in Southeast Mass and Rhode Island with rain falling. The top number on the left will tell you the temperature. Uh, but notice, you know, when you get into the interior, it's a little cooler. Temperatures 33, 34 starting to drop. But your true sub-freezing air is coming down. And you can see, again, northeast winds like Hayden was talking about here in southern New Hampshire. Portsmouth is down to 27. Uh, I'm sorry, 31 uh, with mid to 20s not too far away and even teens here in eastern new york 18 degrees in albany so the cold air is certainly coming along and let's zoom let's go a little bit to 8 a.m notice now like that uh, graphic showed by eight o'clock the merrimack valley uh, northeast mass all below freezing at that point um, still above freezing across uh, much of central Massachusetts, but areas in the Berkshires, that Arctic air has plunged right in. It's 22 in North Adams and 28 in Pittsfield. So still a lot of rain across the region. The 50s are getting squeezed a little bit farther south now. Um, Providence and points south for the most part, but um, that line is starting to make progress going south. And notice by 10 o'clock, it's into Metro Boston. And Logan is down to 31 degrees, um, getting into Worcester at that point at 32. Um, still, you know, taking a little bit more time out in uh, western Massachusetts. The main push here is usually here in the east along the coastal plain. Uh, but even in southeast Mass and Rhode Island, now it's in the mid to upper 30s. So those 50s are almost gone. They're on the islands, Block Island and the vineyard Nantucket. But um, that cold air is certainly making its progress. And you can see also uh, fairly strong winds. Each of these little lines, uh, the, the, the longer lines are 10 knots or about 12 miles per hour. The smaller lines are about five knots or seven miles per hour. So 15 knots here, you know, as the cold air is surging down. Um, so that's giving it certainly a good push. Uh, and then by noontime, um, it's in the South Shore. Uh, areas, you know, have dropped below freezing. Uh, much of Central Mass and Western Mass are below freezing. Just Springfield is just getting below freezing at that point. But still, you know, low to mid 30s across Connecticut, Rhode Island, Southeast Mass at noontime. Uh, so we've got a little longer to go to get below freezing there. And you can see by two o'clock then uh, it's slowly making progress. That's typically what happens. Sometimes if there's not enough of a push, it'll get, you know, take its time getting across the southeast part of Mass. But it's into northern Rhode Island and now into northern Connecticut. Bradley and Windsor Locks is down to 32. So um, the cold air definitely made its way. But this was our trouble spot. Remember, looking where all the accidents were and all the impacts, uh, Route 2, the Mass Pike, Temperatures are in the mid to upper 20s at this point. I see a lot of sleet uh, and some snow being reported in some of the stations here and uh, even, you know, 20 degree air coming down from Maine. So still, you know, good push of cold air coming out of this event. So in summary, uh, rain changed to freezing rain, sleet, and eventually some light snow in southern New England. Again, hundreds of accidents were reported, especially during that Friday morning commute as the changeover occurred in, uh, along and north of the Mass Pike. And that time over, uh, the timing of the changeover was the main forecast concern um, due to its you know, the coincidence with the Friday morning and afternoon commute. So uh, the models and their ensembles showed the potential for an anomalous or an unusual event. And the higher resolution models really did a reasonable job with the changeover timing. If anything, just a few hours too fast um, near the Mass, point, mass Pike and, and points to the south. As you noticed in that last image, the, the cold air was, took its time to get into areas like Plymouth and, and Taunton. So with that, uh, we will open it up to questions from here. We'll take a pause and then we'll uh, get on to our weather briefing. So let's see. Hey, I'm not seeing any questions, Hayden. <laughs> so it looks like uh, we'll give a couple of minutes here. Uh, but hey, yeah, more, any any more, right now. did you have any more thoughts on that event? I mean, it's it's unusual for us to see, you know, I don't remember having lived here like 25 years. It's rare to see so much sleet. It's usually a quicker transition, um, you know, to from going from rain over to snow. And, you know, you get an hour or two of sleet, and that's kind of it. But it's rare for us to have hours and hours of sleet where you're getting an inch or two of accumulation. <clears throat> yeah, you don't see that too much around here. It's usually like, like you said, Joe, 
you know, you get the rain, it'll transition to sleet and then it'll go to snow or end. It won't really stay sleet. Um, but I think it, the air mass was just, the cold was just shallow enough uh, to keep that sleet. We just couldn't cool down a loft. And I, I think one of the reasons why was when Joe showed that uh, mid-level low tracking to our north, that kept just enough warm air in the mid-levels to really prevent a snowstorm. Right. And yeah, I mean, I, um, I'm saying, yeah, Jonathan just made a comment, a two inch sleet event in Boston, February, 1979, since like the mid nineties, I've only remembered maybe one or two that have been like this. So they are certainly rare, uh, definitely rare events. Uh, and Sebastian wanted to know, do we know what some of the observed ice totals were? I believe they were all under a quarter of an inch. Hayden, do you recall? Yeah. So uh, mainly they were a 10th to a quarter inch. I think the, a quarter inch is really the, highest amount I re can recall seeing. Um, but I think most were like a tenth to two tenths of an inch. Uh, that seemed to be the general idea here. They just transitioned to sleet too quickly uh, for much more than that. Right. Yeah. And that's what I remember as well. Um, question from Robert. Have either of you seen a rise in the number of anomalous weather events in the past few years? That's a good question. You want to take a stab at that? You, you know, it, it's 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 really tough to like correlate that. Um, it does it, just thinking outside the box. It definitely seems that way, um, but I think we're so much more aware of like these parameters and you know how they the ensemble data and how we can kind of compare it to climatology. We have a lot of like tools that you know, we can we can utilize. So I think in the past, maybe some events that were quite unusual, if it didn't have like, you know, like something like widespread power outages or a paralyzing blizzard, it, it may go unnoticed in, in, in that sense. So like this event, it was it was unusual from a standpoint of just getting that much sleep. Um, and it was a significant impact. Obviously, it wasn't you know, a devastating impact either. So I, I think there's a couple things at work, but if I had a, I have, I had a, yes, I, I, I do think we are seeing an overall increase in anomalous events um, across, at least in our part of the country. Yeah. And there, you know, we, we do know that the number of um, events that have greater than a half inch of precipitation, whether, you know, liquid whether it be pure rain or even like a snow equivalent, those are increasing here in the Northeast. And kind of, I guess something we'll have to leave to the climatologists to sort it all out because uh, they'll look at it over a longer time range. But um, yeah, you know, either we're in just more of an active weather, you know, kind of weather cycle. Um, I know that the 2000s and 2010s, we had a number of, um, I would say, higher end winter storms and blizzards, Hayden, <laughs> um, yeah. than we did in the that's 90s. You know, not to say you can't get them, but it seems like we had more of them, uh, you know, whether that's related to some sort of climate change or just, you know, a more active period. It's kind of hard to tell. So we'll have to. Yeah, one that. thing. I, what, what, one thing I will say that is it, is quite evident when you when you look at the snowfall totals, um, they've actually in New England in our area, they've actually increased slightly. Um, but what's more notable about that is the season to season variation. Let, you know, you'll have like one extreme where you, you know, the winter of 2011, 2012, where Boston couldn't even get 10 inches of snow. And then obviously 2014, 2015, we had over 100 in the snow blitz. So it's not just those two years. I think you're seeing more daily variations in it because I think that may be a part of getting bigger storms, yet the being somewhat warmer. If you don't have the overall pattern, it's really hard to get much. But if you do, then you can get quite a bit of it. But again, there's a lot of factors that work. It's hard to, you know, say if that's yeah. completely yeah. You know, and as, out, see a shift back to, you know, kind of the 80s and 90s in the next 10 to 20 years. Right. And that's, you know, we always tell people, well, you know, as meteorologists, we're dealing in kind of the shorter, you know, <laughs> range. And uh, it's it's the climatologists who really take a look back and, um, you know, can can see more definitive trends. We, you know, we kind of look at our weather normals over 30 year periods and it's kind of a snapshot of those 30 years. So, um, yeah, but good point, Hayden. Actually, I, I've noticed, you know, where I am, my, my snow average has actually gone up um, in the past 10, 20 years. It used to be around 40, 45 inches. Now I'm closer to 50. So it's a, and I think the new, the new normals, as you mentioned, for the climate sites have gone up a tick as well. So, um, you know, whether that's just an artifact of the 2000s, 2010s or, or a longer trend, we'll just kind of have to see. So um, 
I guess to be determined. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Uh, so, okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. So, uh, 